Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, if you believe it, let's stand to your feet. Come on, if you believe it. Hallelujah. Come on, stand to your feet and receive what God has for you. Come on, lift up holy hands in his presence this morning. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. God, in the name of Jesus, we receive every blessing, every miracle, every deliverance, God. We receive it right now, God, in the name of Jesus. Even though we may not believe it, but God, you know we need it. We need you, God. We need you, God. We need you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. We receive it now, God. We receive it now, God. The outpouring. We receive it now, God. The outpouring. Come on, lift those hands and receive what God has for you this morning. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, God. Bless your name, Lord Jesus. And we thank you, God. And we thank you, God. And we give you glory. Come on, let's bless him. Hallelujah. Put those hands together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Yeah, God, thank you. Thank you. Amen. Bless your name, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Brother BJ, Reverend BJ, my friend. Thank you for that. Thank you. Amen. I am very grateful to be here today. I was sharing with Pastor Roz that um, I've been here several times before, but I don't think I've been here on a Sunday morning. Yeah, and so it was so refreshing to be here on a Sunday morning with all of you. So I thank you, Pastor Roz. Thank you. I thank God for our friendship um, and uh, for the relationship that we have and just, just how God has knitted us together and Reverend Dr. Tama and others, um, how God has just knitted us together in a very special way. Uh, but it's really good to be here with all of you on this, this wonderful Sunday uh, morning. And we're going to get right into the Word because we, we have to get to the conference. <laughs> and we want to make sure the pastor eats a little something, something. Amen. Amen. So let's, let's get right into the Word. Uh, if you wouldn't mind turning to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31, if you wouldn't mind turning. And let's stand all over the house for all that are able. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, and we're going to begin reading at verse 10 through 13. And I would encourage you to go back and read the full text on your own, but for the sake of the message, we're going to simply focus on verse 10 through 13. Jeremiah 31, 10 through 13, and it reads, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scared Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall be like a water garden, and they shall languish no more. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. As you take your seats with love and honor, God's word for God's people, as you take your seats for love and honor, I, I'd like to um, 
uh, asked for each someone to get with somebody else. Everybody look at somebody. Everybody look at someone. And, and you're, going to, you're going to speak this to them. You don't have to know what's going on in their life, but here's what I want you to say. And say it like you mean it. And I, and I even want my brothers that are out in the, in the, in the foyer area. Y'all look at each other. I see y'all through the glass. <laughs> um, but I want you to look at someone. Look at someone and tell them this. God is turning things around. Yeah, they didn't get it. Find someone else who needed to hear that. Find, look at someone else and tell them, you, you didn't know it. You didn't know it. You didn't see it this morning. You didn't feel it. But I want to tell you this morning, God is turning things around. Uh-huh. Yeah, now, now, now tap yourself, prophesy to yourself over your own issues, over your own circumstances and situations, and tap yourself and say, self, be not discouraged. Because God is turning things around. Hallelujah. Anybody need God to turn something around? Anybody need God to turn something around? You don't need him to turn around next year. You need him to turn around right now. Any, anybody need God to turn it around today? God, I need to turn around today. Not next year. I, I'm, I, I'm grateful for 2014. But in 2013, God, I need to turn around. Anybody need God to... The story goes, a man walks into a church. It was a beautiful church. It was a huge church. The church had the latest technology, new seats, new carpets. Everything was shiny. Everything was blinged out. Uh, the stained glass windows were brand new and beautiful. They had done, you could clearly see when the man walked in the church, they had done a huge renovation on the church. The man walks in and, and he sees the beauty of the wonderful edifice that has been newly erected, newly renovated, and it's beautiful. But he notices when he walks in the church that the church is empty. He sees a beautiful church and a beautiful building, but the place was empty. Except for one old little mother who happened to be sitting in the corner of the front pew. And he, he goes up to her and he says, Mother, this is a beautiful church. I see they put in the latest technology and new stained glass windows and everything is shiny and everything is blinged out. He says, but where are the people? Yeah. Old mother says, well... There was a huge church fight, and we spent all the money and all the time and all the energy resurrecting and erecting and renovating this beautiful building, but we didn't take time to take care of the people. And as a result, we got a new building, but we have... No people. We renovated the building, but left the people broken. God, Israel is sent into captivity. And, and while they're in captivity, they experience not just a loss of things physically. But if you read the text, it, 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 the Bible records that, that something began to happen to the people. It, it, it wasn't so much that, the, that their stuff was lost and their homes were lost and their crops were lost, but, but if you go back and read the text, you, you get the sense that something began to happen to the people. If you go back and read Jeremiah and Isaiah, you understand that the people, while they're in great captivity, they don't just suffer loss of the stuff, but they began to lose something on the inside. And God 
God is not satisfied when he begins to give them a word of restoration. He's not satisfied just with restoring the stuff. Because you can restore stuff, but if you don't restore people, you will have beautiful churches that are empty. And because God is not simply interested in restoring homes and restoring cars and restoring businesses, but God is in the business of restoring people. And so, and so in, in this particular chapter of Jeremiah, the prophet is, is speaking to individuals who, are, who have been scattered as a result of the, of the horror they have experienced. They, they, they are basically refugees out in the wilderness. And the prophet writes to them to let them know that even though they are out in the wilderness, God not only is going to restore some things, but God is going to restore the people. The prophet, the prophet is speaking to individuals who have escaped the great battle or some kind of, of slaughter that was coming against him. So here they are, refugees who have escaped a great horror. And the prophet is raised up to give good news to a nation who has managed to escape. Ah. And because you today, Walker Temple, represent those who are the manifestation of God's glory, you are they who have escaped. This morning, I want to encourage those of you who have made a great escape who knows what it means to get away. Some of you in here have escaped attack on your life, escaped the horrors of a dysfunctional home, have escaped the pull of the allure of the street life, have escaped what could have been a deadly drug addiction, have escaped a violent partner or a violent spouse, have escaped a sick pedophile, have escaped an assassination attempt on your life, sent by Satan, but you escaped. Ah, yeah, the prophet this morning, the prophet in Jeremiah is speaking to individuals who have escaped. But they're out in the wilderness. Uh, and if you know anything about the wilderness, the wilderness is a place of nothingness. The wilderness represents a place of loss. The wilderness represents a place of being in the middle of nowhere. But the Bible says that it was in the wilderness that they found grace. And many of you have been in the wilderness, in the middle of nowhere. No friends, no help, no support, no resources, no money, no way in and no way out. In the middle of nowhere. But would you high five your neighbor and tell your neighbor it's in the middle of nowhere. Well, the grace of God shows up. And so just in case this morning, you find yourself having escaped, but in the middle of nowhere. Would you slap your neighbor and tell your neighbor you in the right place at the right time because you're about to experience the manifestation of the glory of God? Is there anybody up in here who knows what it's like having escaped trauma in the middle of nowhere? But God is going to show up. So, and so I want to encourage the discouraged, lift up the downtrodden, bring joy back to the sorrowful because God has his eye on some individuals you managed to escape the hell of your life but you found yourself in the middle of nowhere but the grace of God
God. In the middle of nowhere, these refugees have escaped. They've made it out of the hands of the enemy. But they're still in the middle of nowhere. Oh, and what this text illuminates is that God was not simply interested, Pastor, in getting them back into their homes. God was not interested in just restoring their crops. God was not interested in giving them new buildings and new cars and new businesses because God understands that if you give broken people new things, they will break the new things. And so here it is, they're refugees in the wilderness and God says, before I send them back to new homes and new cars and new stuff I've got to make them new on the inside again oh and so oh oh and so and so in this season y'all as you step into being the manifestation of God's glory understand this God is not going to just restore the stuff now you're going to get your stuff back high five your neighbor I'm getting my stuff back Ah, but more importantly, God is going to restore somebody their peace of mind. God is going to restore to someone the joy in their soul. God is going to restore a pep in your step and a skip in your walk. Is there anybody up in here that said, restore me, God? Because you can be out, but not whole. You can be out, but it not be out of you. You can be out, but not satisfied. You can be out, but still angry. You can be out, but still broken. You can be out, but still hurt. You can be out, but still bitter. You can be out, but still got a grudge. You can be out, but still depressed. You can be out and still live in fear. And God says, I don't just want you out. I want you whole again. Uh, uh, and there, oftentimes, those who have escaped the attack on your life, you can leave a bad situation and still be angry that God let it happen to you. You can come out of a bad relationship and still be bitter that that Negro did you that way. You can be out of a bad work environment and still hold a grudge that they gave you a pink slip. But would you slap your neighbor and tell your neighbor in this next season of your life where God is taking you, you're going to have to let some of that stuff go and God is going to restore you. So, so I come to announce to someone who hasn't been getting good sleep at night. I've come to announce to someone who's been holding a grudge. I've come to announce to someone who's been depressed about what happened. I've come to announce to someone who's been sad about what they went through. I've come to announce to someone who's still carrying the baggage of yesteryear into this year. Would you let somebody know today is the last day. Today is over. Declare in the name of Jesus. Sadness must go. Depression must go. Anger must go. Bitterness must go. Grudge must go. Frustration must go. In the name of Jesus. Because where God is taking them next, God says, I can't. Uh, I can't take you out from the wilderness to restore stuff because if I take you broken into a new place, you'll break that place up too. And so part of the reason why God allows us to hang out in the wilderness is because there's some stuff on the inside that God 
wants to work out. And so when you're in the wilderness place, that's not the time to get an attitude with God. That's not the time to throw in the towel. That's not the time to give up. But that's the time to recognize God has set aside some time just for me. Would you high five your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I'm in the wilderness, baby. I'm in the wilderness, baby. But keep your eye on me. Keep your eye on me. Because when I come out of the wilderness, when I come out of a dry place, when I come out, I'm coming out whole again. God says, a prophet, God says, uh, I want to I wanna give somebody their peace of mind back. I want to give somebody their, their rejoicing back. I want to see the, the young women dance again. I want to see the old men and the young men have some joy in them again. And so God keeps them in the wilderness. Ah, and the prophet raises up and lets them know you've been in the wilderness. You had to hang out here a little while. You had to be in this place where you felt like you were in the middle of nowhere. You didn't have no friends, no money, no resources, no hookup, no connections, no support. But God said, that's all right because I've been there with you all along. See, the evidence that we are the manifestation of his glory is that I did not die in the wilderness. Even though I didn't have no friends, even though I didn't have no money, even though I didn't have no support I did not die in the wilderness why because the grace the grace the grace of God would you slap your neighbor and tell your neighbor I am the manifestation of his glory so, and so proof that we are God's children is that even when God has us in the wilderness place we don't die in the wilderness Ah, but, but while they're in the wilderness, the prophet rises up and he speaks to their concerns. He speaks to their pain. He speaks to their issue. And then he lets them know, but God is going to turn this thing around. Ah, I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. I don't know who woke up this morning feeling like things weren't going to turn around and that you are where you are is where you're going to be. But God woke me up this morning and sent me here, Walker Temple, to announce to somebody, you've been in the wilderness long enough. You've been in a dry place long enough. You've been by yourself long enough. You've been doing it on your own long enough. But because you were faithful in the wilderness, because you didn't give up in the wilderness because you didn't throw in the towel in the wilderness because you kept coming to church even though you were living in the wilderness because you kept serving your pastor even though you were in the wilderness God said to the people I'm turning this thing around would you turn around and slap your neighbor and tell your neighbor God is turning things around Yeah. Uh, and he's not just turning things around, Reverend Ross. But the Bible speaks to turning their sorrow into rejoicing. See, it's not just enough that God turns my finances around. It's not just enough that God turns my housing situation around. It's not just enough that God turns the business around. It's not enough even if God turned the church around. But what God speaks to is not only am I going to turn the external things around, but I'm going to turn some internal things around. I'm going to turn the anger into peacefulness, sadness into rejoicing, hopelessness into hopefulness. Bitterness into kindness. Would you high five your neighbor and tell your neighbor in this season, God's turning me around? So, so, 
Reverend Juju, uh, what do I do if I'm in the wilderness place? I get that God's going to turn some things around. But what do I do while I'm waiting on the turnaround? Uh, because it's great to know God's turning it around. But if you don't know what to do while you're waiting on the turnaround, you'll mess up your own turnaround. Uh huh. God will be trying to turn things around, and you'll be trying to turn it back the other way. Uh, but, uh, but when you're in the wilderness and God is working on your turnaround, uh, here's the first thing. Uh, uh, God allows them to go through this because he wants to turn them back to him. Uh -huh. uh, see, see, when you're in the wilderness place, uh, that's not the time to stop praying. Mm -hmm. That's not the time to stop worshiping. That's not the time to stop coming to church. That's not the time to become unfaithful to your service. But when you find yourself in a wilderness place, what God is trying to do is to get you and me to turn back to him. And when the people turn back to God, guess what? God turned back to them. Would you take Tell your neighbor, get watch out, because in this season, I'm getting my praise on. In this season, I'm going to worship harder. I'm going to pray harder. I'm going to fast more. I'm going to be in Bible study, because I'm turning back to God. So God allows him to be in the wilderness, because he wants to see the people turn back to him. Because upon our turnaround, that's when God initiates the turnaround in us and for us. The other thing, the second thing to do when you're in the wilderness place is you got to trust him. Now, now, here, here's where I know y'all shaking heads, yeah, but this is actually harder to do than to say it, uh-huh. Uh, because when you're in the wilderness place, uh, uh, you don't really recognize what God is doing. Uh, uh, I can prove it to you uh, because uh, when, when Abraham and Sarah kick out Hagar, the Bible says he kicks out Hagar and Hagar uh, begins to prophesy that her own son is going to die. And so she puts him under a bush and she steps back because she doesn't want to witness her son die because they're in the wilderness. They have no food. They have no money. Their food stamps have ran out. Abraham and Sarah didn't give them a benefits package. And so Hagar and her baby boy are in the wilderness. But when she turned to God, the Bible says God allowed her to see the well of water that was right in front of her. Can I, can I help you out? When you're in the wilderness place, you won't even see that God has a blessing right in front of you. And so when you're in the wilderness place, it's important to trust God because oftentimes when you can't see God, that's when God is at his best. When you can't see God, that's when God is doing God's thing. Would you slap your neighbor and tell your neighbor, this is the season when you cannot trace God, when you cannot track God. This is the season to stand on the word of God and trust God. So, so he says, he says to them, because you were faithful in the wilderness and you turned back towards me. And you, you kept trusting me, even though you couldn't track and trace what I was doing. Uh, he says, I'm going to turn the situation around. Uh, and I've come to announce to someone there's about to be a major shift in the atmosphere. Uh-huh. Uh, God is turning around uh, things. He's turning around individuals, but he's also shifting the atmosphere because what he says in the text, he talks about their enemies being afraid of them. Uh huh. Oh, y'all missed it. Uh, their enemies being afraid of them. See, you're about to be such a miracle that those who are talking about you, those who are hating on you, those who are waiting for you to die in the wilderness, those who are hoping you wouldn't make it, those who are hoping you couldn't stand, those who want to see you die, those who want to see you fall out, would you slap your neighbor and tell your neighbor they about to be scared of me? High five your neighbor and say, honey, I 
I'm scared of you. High five someone else and say, I'm scared of you. See, when God starts turning things around, you become a threat to other people because they were hoping you wouldn't come out of this one. They were hoping you wouldn't make it through this one. They were hoping you would die through this challenge. They were hoping you lose your mind in this challenge. They were hoping you'd be so hopeless you commit suicide. They were hoping that you would die emotionally. But would you slap your neighbor and tell your neighbor, I'm still here. Yeah! 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 Because people don't understand how it is. You lost all that you lost. And you went through all that you went through. And they watch you be a refugee in the wilderness. Wow. Huh. And what people don't understand is when those things begin to turn around. <laughs> and so the next time you see someone, no, as a matter of fact, next time you see a hater, uh huh, and they're questioning your deliverance, and they're questioning your restoration, and they're questioning how it is you made it out of this one, and they're wondering how it is you still got a smile on your face, and they're wondering how it is you still got a leap in your step, and they're wondering how it is you coming to church Sunday after Sunday, giving God all the glory. Would you just tell them, God, turn things around for me, baby? God, turn things things around. God turn things around. High five your neighbor and prophesy to your neighbor. God is turning things around. Yeah. Yeah. God bless you.